Good morning. I'm Reverend Meredith Barber, and I'm the minister here at Horizon. We're glad to welcome you on this gloomy Sunday morning to our worship service. We're so glad to have us with you today, whether you're joining us in person or virtually, whether you're here for the first time this morning or whether you've been here for quite a long time. Here at Horizon, we welcome people of all faiths and of no faith in particular. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey, you are welcome here among us. So I have one exciting thing to tell you about this morning. Um, at 1145, after our worship service, we're going to have a Q&A for folks who might be visitors or if you've visited for quite a while. It's going to be in the library. If you don't know where the library is, please ask someone and they will help you find it. So that's a Q&A for folks who are visiting, who are new to Unitarian Universalism, who have some questions they want to ask. And I'd like to now invite Joel forward with an announcement about our chili cook-off. Good morning. I hope you've all heard that next Saturday we will be having our a chili cook-off fundraiser for the church. It's Saturday at 5 o'clock. Uh, it's... We are open to everybody to come up and make their own chili and bring chili and uh, we'll have a tasting and people who attend it will be able to vote on which is the best. Uh, we have, will have sign up in the lobby after the service if you, if you have not signed up yet. And uh, they will be selling tickets for it if you don't wanna make chili but just wanna attend and help raise money for the church. Uh, the, the winner will be the person who, there'll be tip jars by all the, the tables, and whoever raises the most money at, at their tip jar for, for the church will be the winner of the chili cook-off. That's how we take judgmental out, uh, aspect out of it <laughs> and, uh, and make it strictly monetary. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you would like to help and volunteer with the chili cook-off, you can see us at the table after service. So that's all I got to say. Our call to worship this morning is adapted from our time together from the writings of the Reverend Clark Dewey Wells. Spirit of life and hope, awaken us again to the mysteries that humble us, the realities that orient us, the truths that judge and guide us the beauty that informs and ravishes us, the love that nurtures us, the fellowship that sustains us, the creativity that heightens and deepens and reorders our living, that we may give ourselves in honesty and openness to the larger life before us. Come, let us worship together. We light our chalice this morning with these words from George Kimmich Beach. In the mystery of life about us, there is light. It gives us a place to be, to grow, to rejoice together. It opens the pathways to love. In this place of friendship, there is freedom. Let the light we kindle go before us, strong in hope, wide in goodwill, inviting the day to come. I invite you to join now in saying together the words of our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of our church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity with the harm, in harmony with the earth. Thus do we covenant together. I invite you to rise, either in body or in spirit, and join in singing our opening hymn, Gather the Spirit. I'm sorry. Gather the Spirit, harvest the power, our separate fires will 
kindle one flame witness the mystery of this hour our dwells in this light appear the same gather in peace gather in thanks gather in sympathy now and then gather in hope compassion and strength gather to celebrate once again gather the spirit of heart and mind seeds for the sowing with our late in store nurtured in love and conscious we find with body and spirit united once more gather in peace gather in thanks gather in sympathy now and then gather in hope compassion and strength Gather to celebrate once again. Gather the spirit growing in all, drawn by the moon and fed by the sun. Winter to spring and summer to fall, with other lives resounding as one. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion and strength, gather to celebrate once again. Okay, folks, so at this time, I'd like to invite us, if you've brought donations for MetroCrest, pass them to the end of an aisle, and we'll invite our young folks to come forward, okay? Come on up. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, friends. So today our story, I'm just gonna warn you, it's gonna be a little bit longer, but it's a really good story, I promise, okay? So let's get into a comfy position. Let's take a deep breath and chill, and we're gonna just listen, okay? So once upon a time, a long, long time ago, before even your grown-ups were born, there was something called a mystery. She was a great mystery, but nobody really understood or appreciated her because there was nobody else around. Nobody else could understand much of anything. And so for a long, long time in the world, the mystery waited. And she waited some more, and then she decided that she was really bored. And so the mystery set the stars in the heavens and planets to circle the stars and comets to wander to and fro. And it was all so beautiful. But after a while, the mystery decided that it was still boring. She was lonely. She wanted somebody to play with. Haven't you guys ever felt that way? You want somebody to play with? So she looked around among the stars and the planets, but some of the stars were too hot, and others were too cold, and some of the planets were too big, and other ones were too small. But finally, she found one that was just right. The planet was covered with water, but there were huge chunks of land sticking out, and even mountains and plains and rivers and best of all, there were little tiny creatures that lived and squirmed in the water. 
She's talking about Earth. Come play with me, the mystery said, but they just kept squirming like they hadn't even heard her, which wasn't surprising because they didn't have any ears. So then she got an idea. She decided to glue some of them together, and then when they were stuck together, they began working together, and they formed eyes and feet and mouths and stomachs and ears. So they could see and move around and digest, and they could hear. And it was more interesting because as the new creatures watched and moved around, they changed. They grew and they evolved, and soon there were all kinds of different animals in the seas and on the land and mountains and rivers, and there were cows and sheep and pigs. But the mystery started thinking. Maybe some of these animals could use their mouths for singing or talking instead of just eating and then they would make even better people to play with. So for a while, everything went great. There were new creatures, and they called themselves humans. And for a long time, the humans lived in balance with all the other creatures. And the mystery liked watching them and giving them new ideas, but she was always careful to make sure that the humans never saw her or heard her directly because then she wouldn't be a mystery anymore. But the humans were curious. Was the mystery human like they were? Was the mystery male or female or something else entirely? Did the mystery care about them? Of course she did. If they prayed hard enough, would the mystery make their crops grow? Perhaps, but only if you take care of the earth. Would the mystery punish their enemies? The mystery said to herself, I don't think so. Your enemies want me to punish you, but I won't do that either. But the humans had a lot of other questions, like where do we come from? What are we supposed to do with our lives? Why do people get sick and suffer and die? But the mystery was silent about these things. She knew that if she spoke to them, the humans would think she was a god, a god like they wrote about in their ancient books. But she was greater, beyond anything the humans could imagine. She didn't want to terrify them either. And it was more interesting this way. So more time passed, and I'll speed it up a little bit. The humans kept evolving, and they made big cities, and they built roads, and they harvested crops, they built machines for traveling on roads, and they argued a lot about what they were supposed to be doing with their lives. But the mystery kept quiet, hoping they would figure it out for themselves. But the humans kept building cities and roads, and soon the the world was filled with more humans, and there was no more room for animals. The humans were running out of room too. Some thought there was no more room for the mystery either. When the mystery realized that the humans thought they had figured everything out for themselves, she got really, really sad. Some of the humans said that the mystery was angry, and if everybody didn't do what she said, she would destroy them. Others said that they didn't need the mystery anymore. They could do fine on their own. It seemed like they were too busy building and arguing to play anymore. So she wanted to say something, but she knew her voice would terrify the humans. She also believed that they would argue about the meaning of her words. They couldn't even agree on, thou shall not kill, or love your enemies. They didn't know what those meant. And besides, she knew that simply making the humans do what she wanted would not be very fun. So maybe there was another way. She knew the humans wouldn't listen to her no matter how loudly or clearly she spoke. Maybe instead of telling them what to do in a big, loud voice, she should use a softer voice, like a whisper. Maybe instead of speaking to their ears, she should speak to their hearts. Maybe instead of using words, she should use feelings. And so that's what she did. If you listen very closely, you will hear what the mystery is saying to you. Don't listen with your ears. Listen with your heart. 
Think about what you feel when you consider this beautiful planet our home. Do you feel joy? Do you feel a sense of wonder? Do you feel thankful? Do you feel love? Each of these feelings is a part of the mystery because each of us is part of the mystery. When we recognize and act on our feelings of joy, wonder, thanksgiving, and love, the mystery will play with us and through us for a long time to come. Amen and blessed be. And thank you. We're going to sing you all out to your classes now. Thank you so much for listening so well. We often talk about giving through the lens of things that grow, asking ourselves, what will we plant for those who come after us? Now is the time in our service that we share our gifts to support the ministries of this church. The offering will now be joyfully given and received. Our first reading this morning comes from the writings of Frederick Buechner. He writes, There are mysteries you can solve by thinking. For instance, a murder mystery whose mysteriousness must be dispelled in order for the truth to be known. There are other mysteries that do not conceal a truth to think your way to, but whose truth is itself the mystery. The mystery of yourself, for example. The more you try to fathom it, the more fathomless it is revealed to be. No matter how much of yourself you are able to objectify and examine, the quintessential living part of yourself will always elude you. That is, the part that is conducting the examination. Thus, you don't solve the mystery, you live the mystery. And you do not do that by fully knowing yourself, but by fully being yourself. We come now to the time in our worship service that we set aside for prayer and meditation. We'll share in a time of silence, hear the joys and sorrows of our community, hear a spoken prayer, and join in singing our responsive hymn, Spirit of Life. I invite you to join me now in a time of silence. We have both joys and sorrows to share this morning. The first says rain, unclear whether it's a joy or a sorrow, maybe both, (laughs) maybe both. We are in sorrow this morning with Menica and Bhaskar. October is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month, and we remember Omar, who passed through our lives 21 years ago. We remember him. We also celebrate with Sean and Bethany, who got engaged yesterday. Congratulations. (laughs) 
loving God, spirit of life, mystery in which we live and move and have our being. Draw near to us this morning and hear our prayers. We give thanks for this gloomy morning, for it is a new beginning, a chance to gather, a chance to be in community, a chance to give our minds a chance to wonder about the world. This morning, some of us too gather in grief, gather in lament, gather in this place worried, stressed, frustrated, angry. Let us this morning await the presence of the mystery within us. Let us allow our minds to wander. Let us allow ourselves to be open to all that we cannot know or understand. Let us accept whatever comes to us in the days and weeks ahead as a gift. And let us await that feeling of calling within us. Let us turn our attention to what love is calling us to do in the world around us. Who is love calling us to be? Spirit of life, for these and all those things left unnamed in the silence of our hearts, let us pray today and every day. Amen. I invite us to remain seated and join together in singing our responsive hymn, Spirit of Life. second reading comes from the writings of Thich Nhat Hanh. I like to walk alone on country paths, rice plants and wild grasses on both sides, putting each foot down, foot down on the earth in mindfulness, knowing that I walk on the wondrous earth. In such moments, existence is a miraculous and mysterious reality. People usually consider walking on water or in thin air, but to walk on earth. Every day we are engaged in a miracle which we don't even recognize. A blue sky, white clouds, green leaves, the black curious eyes of a child, our own two eyes, all is a miracle. Our story begins this Sunday with the writings of a woman who lived long ago in times of extreme trial. The writings of Julian of Norwich have become popular in recent years for reasons I suspect have to do with our human need for comfort. The need we have to know that it will all be okay. She is famous for her words, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, which are said to have come to her in a vision when she was close to death. Julian was a 12th century anchoress, which meant that she was someone who had withdrawn from society to live a religious life, kind of like a religious hermit. But unlike hermits, anchorites were required to stay in one place 
So Julian's life was lived mainly in a small cell with a little window. However, around her, outside that window, the world was chaotic. She lived during the time of the Black Death, during rebellions and uprisings that began in her city. It was tumultuous and suffering was all around. Julian was someone too who wanted to have the experience of extreme illness in hopes that that experience would bring her closer to the divine. Around the age of 30, she got her wish. She became so ill that after several days, she received the last rites and her family presumed her dead. But when her mother reached down to close her eyes, she began to have a series of visions about the passion of the Christ. And what I think is important that we can take from Julian's story is that what has come out of her writings, some of the earliest English writings by a woman, is a sense of trust in the universe, that it will all be well. Her story is myst mystifying in certain ways by today's norms, of course. Why would anyone wish to become ill? Why would someone want to experience pain, to shut themselves away from the world? But what I hear in her writings is this overwhelming sense that the universe is speaking to her, reminding her that she is not alone, even in the most extreme circumstances. And that, se that sense that she has is a common thread in mysticism across time and place. Rachel Naomi Remen says something similar of her grandfather. She writes, he had this sense that the universe was always at work, always speaking to him, and that he could speak back. And that, I think, is what the spiritual life is all about. It's learning to hear the mystery of the universe at work and learning to talk back. And this, I think, points us to the first of the six sources we draw from in Unitarian Universalism. Our first source is direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder, affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. The Reverend Kathleen Rollins writes, Moses encountered a burning bush and took off his shoes in order to honor the sacred ground he stood upon. Buddha saw the morning star and attained enlightenment. Muhammad rose from his sleep and recorded what he heard Allah telling him to write. Jesus fasted in the desert and then returned, full of the spirit, to preach about the kingdom of God. Each of these holy people pointed towards something larger than their own personal experience or our common existence. The first source describes how we also point to our experiences of awe. And there's a reason I think that this is our first source. This is kind of the kindling we need to light the fire within us that reminds us that the universe is speaking to us. People across traditions talk about wanting to have this kind of direct experience to feel pain, to feel suffering, to feel hunger, just as we saw in Julian's story earlier. She is far from the only one, just the one whose writings have survived. And I hear within that the desire to have a kind of faith that you can feel in your own body, something you can touch and see and taste and hear. The desire, I think, is to have a kind of faith you know is real because you have felt it. But the thing that I think is unique about Unitarian Universalism is that we're taught to trust our own experience. We don't need something to let us know it's real. It doesn't have to be filtered through someone else's concept of the divine to be real to us. I've heard lots of folks processing out of various other traditions say, 
I didn't know if I could trust myself or what I was feeling. The writer Kate Kennedy jokes, was it the Holy Spirit or was it just chord progression? Who knows? Here, we learn to trust ourselves, and it can take time to tune ourselves toward the mystery we talked about earlier with the kids. Here, there's room for these little moments in our lives to be considered sacred, not because we heard the voice of God, though we may have, but simply because we deem them so. As a professor once said to me, Meredith, before we can do anything else, we read first the text of our own experience. The Reverend Joanna Fontaine Crawford talks about how her experience is shifting over time, saying, now when I have a mystical experience, the first thing I ask myself is not, is this real, but what can I do with this? What can I do with this? That, I think, is always the question. Kenneth Patton, the famous, the famous humanist universalist of the early 1900s wrote, let us worship with our eyes and ears and fingertips. Let us love the world through heart and mind and body. Yes, may it be so. Humanism, of course, also has a place in this mystery. Humanism is about trusting science and rational thought. To me, such givens that I don't always name them. But of course, all experiments begin with curiosity, with wonder, with a need to find out. And of course, with an admission that there are things we do not know. We have seen in recent years the idea that science and religion must somehow be at odds We've seen that gain more credence, but it has never made sense to me. We know that there will always be things that science cannot explain, that we have not yet made meaning of. And thus the mystery reminds us that there is more to be revealed, that revelation, as we say, is forever unfolding, that there's always more to understand. And the thing is, life always has something in store for us that we did not expect. That's kind of the point. There's always a next chapter, always another unknown. So as humans have done forever, we look for signs. And it's not just because we're seeking comfort, running for cover from uncertain times, but because we're seeking meaning in a life that is so unclear to us. During the times when the unknown is more difficult than beautiful, we look for signs from the universe, signs from something outside of ourselves. And for me, these signs have always come from the natural world. A rainbow, a cool breeze on your face, morning mist over a valley as you watch the sunrise. And they have given me that lump in the throat feeling that Beekner talks about that tells us that's where we need to go next that that's a feeling we need to follow, terrifying as it may be to not know what comes next. The reality of faith, I think, is holding this belief in the rational and what we know for sure with this intuitive sense of signs, of curiosity, of what we know deep down in our gut, but don't know how we know it. And maybe we're at different places on that balance beam between rational and intuitive, but an examined, full, weak faith is going to take both. Frederick Buechner writes, At its heart, I think religion is mystical. Moses with his flocks in Midian, Buddha under the bow tree, Joseph up to his knees in the waters of Jordan, each of them responds to something for which words like, Shalom, oneness, God even, are only pallid, alphabetic souvenirs. I have seen things, Aquinas told a friend, that make all my writings seem like straw. Religion as institution, as ethics, as dogma, all of this comes later, and in the long run, maybe counts for less. Religions start 
as Frost said poems do, with a lump in the throat, to put it mildly, or with the bush going up in flames, the rain of flowers, the dove coming down out of the sky. This quote is an often used favorite of mine that I think can take us in so many different directions. It reminds us that religion, or we might say a spiritually engaged life, begins with something happening to people. It begins with doing something a little bit weird. It begins with taking risks, wondering about things that seem impossible. We trust that knowing deep within us to lead us toward the next right thing. In the words of Elaine Scarry, when we come upon beautiful things, they act like small tears in the surface of the world that pull us through to some vaster space. I said a couple weeks ago that one of the holiest mysteries I know of in this life are our relationships with other people. And this is the constant thread that keeps us going, that keeps us trying again, even when we're tired and feel like giving up. In conversations I have had with each of you individually, this is the thing that keeps coming up again and again and again that we believe that life is about relationships. And there's a concept that kind of gets at this called process theology, which is difficult to explain at best. Lots of ministers like to say they dabble in process or have process tendencies. And I think I would say I am process curious. But at any rate, the idea is that whatever our concept of the divine, if we have one, that that can be created, that something can be created, we don't have to call it divine, in our relationships with one another, in the space between people. And we are always influencing creation. We might say the universe is forever in process, forever in co-creation with us in the mystery we talked about earlier with the kids. And does she care about us? Of course she does. And does she stay silent at times? Of course. And maybe that's where we could find the direct experience Julian wished to have in today's world. Some of you know, and some of you may not, that I spent some years before seminary working on a ranch in Arkansas. And though I look back at that time fondly now, I went reluctantly to say the least. I didn't know the first thing about farm animals or gardening or leading people really, and I was afraid. But as the leaves on the tree outside my window changed, the hot Arkansas summer turned to a cool fall with mist over the valley each morning. And Beekner's words about the religious life beginning with something myst mystical began to ring true for me. Life took on a sort of monastic rhythm dictated by the needs of the animals I was looking after and the people I was teaching. And rising with the sun, I eventually learned to do things like milking goats and building fences and planting trees. And I gained confidence the kind of confidence that comes from learning things you never would have known before and trying and failing and trying again. I learned that a walk in the morning mist could be my prayer and to let people teach me things I never thought I would want to know. And in this way, my faith and my call were strengthened. The song we heard earlier during the offertory, Let the Mystery Be, that is part of the soundtrack to my childhood. And it helped me understand growing up that we all wonder, we all ask questions, and that people have different beliefs about life and the organization of the universe. But none of us really has the answers. In the words of Richard Feynman, I think it's more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of uncertainty about different things, but I am not absolutely sure about anything. 
There are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask, why are we here? I, th I might think about it a little bit, and if I can't figure it out, then I go on to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell. I got a question from a child years ago during a question box sermon that was something like, what happens when we die? And I said something like, you know, nobody really knows what happens, to be honest with you. People have lots and lots of different ideas, but no one really knows. And when you're young, that starts out kind of frustrating, right? Because we want to know. This has to do with the way faith changes over our life. At certain ages, we want a really concrete answer that we know is true for sure. And for many of us, as we get older, we kind of enjoy the spaciousness, the mystery, the excitement, the wonder that comes along with not having all the answers. In the words of Reverend Linda Susan Ulrich, we are joyful, though we have considered all the facts. And I might add the lack thereof. In the story I told the kids earlier, there was the part about some people thinking that there wasn't room for mystery anymore, that they had it all figured out. And I have certainly been guilty of that. I think we all have. Life can really get in the way sometimes of being the kind of people we'd like to be. So in times of frustration with ourselves and one another, in the times when we wake in the middle of the night with worry, when we feel desperate for the answer to what comes next, when the to-do list scrolls endlessly in our mind's eye, let us remember Julian living her life in her cell and writing, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to rise, either in body or in spirit, and join in singing our closing hymn, Just As Long As I Have Breath. We extinguish this flame, but not our commitment to welcome radically, love boldly, grow spiritually, and serve courageously. This we do because we envision a beloved community filled with compassion, helping all to thrive in a just world. So friends, my prayer for you this morning is that you let the mystery play with you and through you for all the days to come. Go in peace. <laughs>